Okay. Welcome everyone to the first think tank of the 2020-2021 academic school year. I'm really chuffed to have Mark Bonder start us off with a topic that's very near and dear to my own heart. Um, Mark is the head of stock assessment for the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission and a SAFS alum. I've also heard rumors that if there's a CAPM sometime around Halloween, perhaps maybe there's a full moon or not, he grows a silvery mullet and becomes an Andre Punt. But that is just a rumor. I was not there. Let's see. Uh, a couple other items that you need to know. Is, well, first, thanks for your patience um, and grace as we figure out the platforms that we can use that both accommodate having NOAA presenters on our lineup and um, just keeping this environment safe from any internet trolls, if you will. Uh, Mark has requested that all questions be addressed after he kind of he introduces the material, and you'll find a questions tab as part of your go-to webinar setup here. If you submit your questions throughout the talk as he goes through the topics, I can see them. They won't interrupt Mark, and then when he's ready, I can provide those questions and feedback and comments to Mark uh, to speak. Um, and then go ahead and shoot me any questions as audience members if anything goes awry. And with that, I would like to hand over the microphone to Mark. Thank you for coming. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be presenting some research we've been doing at the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission on uh, risk analysis. Uh, specifically, we're implementing uh, reference point-based fishery harvest control rules within a probabilistic framework that considers uh, multiple hypotheses. And this is a product of the whole team here at the IATTC uh, stock assessment program. So um, what I'm going to go over today is um, basically the the main components of the, the risk analysis. And so I'm going to be talking about the hierarchical structure that we've put together to uh, develop uh, hypotheses and uh, models, the uh, system that we've used for weighting the different uh, models, um, how we uh, develop the probability distributions for the quantities of interest and how we combine those across the different models and uh, also how to present those results uh, in terms of uh, risk curves and uh, decision tables. Um, so why do we need a, a risk analysis? Uh, well, like all stock assessments, the IATTC assessments um, are uncertain. So there's a lot of parameter uncertainty and, and uh, model uncertainty. Um, and so we, we really need to uh, address that uncertainty and, and present it to the managers. In addition to that, the IATDC has developed new harvest control rules that actually specifically include probability statements. And so, for example, we have to evaluate whether the fishing mortality exceeds uh, limit reference points with a certain amount of uh, probability. And if that occurs, then uh, additional action uh, will take place. And so we have to make several evaluations and, and the main ones we do are basically evaluating the current status relative to uh, our target and, lef, uh, ref, um, target and limit reference points. Um, but we also want to evaluate those under different management scenarios so we can develop management advice for the future. And because we want to include all the uncertainty in these um, analyses, We've transitioned from a single base case assessment, which has kind of been the traditional approach in, in many uh, management agencies, to using a set of uh, reference models to represent the model uncertainty. And one of the main concepts behind the um, risk analysis that we've uh, developed is the fact that uh, rigorous statistical frameworks are generally not applicable to uh, the stock assessment models. And this is because our models are very complex, they're highly parameterized, there's lots of different data sets. Um, and so there's a lot of different model assumptions that are possible and, and can explain the data. Typically our models are misspecified, uh, we ignore a lot of the process error, 
and we're not really um, good at uh, weighting the data appropriately. So the standard um, statistics for um, evaluating models such as uh, likelihood and AIC are not really appropriate. Um, so we shouldn't rely solely on those for uh, evaluating the um, reliability of any models. So these are the main features of the, the risk analysis. Um, the first one is that we develop hypotheses to address issues with the, the current stock assessment. And then we use a, a stock assessment models to represent those different hypotheses. And we group, group those hypotheses in a hierarchical uh, framework. And the reason we do this is uh, twofold. Um, the first is it avoids any single hypothesis dominating the whole uh, analysis. And the second is that it facilitates the development of the models and also weighting of the, of the different models. We also include uh, sub hypotheses that rep represent models with parameters that can't be reliably estimated. Um, and then we develop uh, multiple metrics to evaluate the plausibility of these hypotheses. Um, and so that own, um, model fit only plays a limited role in the weighting of the alternative models. Uh, we also have an efficient uh, approach to eliminate some of the unlikely hypotheses to try and um, make the analysis uh, practical given the, the complexity and um, computational burdens of most of these models. So as far as uncertainty goes, there's really three main uh, sources of uncertainty. There's some others as well, but these are the main ones that you focus on when uh, doing stock assessments. The first is parameter uncertainty, and it's pretty standard practice to account for parameter uncertainty in stock assessment models and uh, presenting results. Typically, we just calculate confidence intervals of the quantities of interest and present those. Um, the second is model structure uncertainty. And this is um, less likely to be included in any management advice. Uh, typically what we do is we'll do sensitivity analyses to uh, model assumptions and parameter values like you know, the growth curve or the, the value of natural mortality or the stock recruitment relationship or the value of steepness. And we present those sensitivities just to give people an idea of, of uh, how uncertain the uh, uh, results are, but we typically don't integrate those directly into the management advice. Um, so when we are wanting to take into consideration all the uncertainty, we really want to take this model uncertainty into account. So we have developed multiple models uh, and we then combine these, uh, the results from these different models together um, somehow. And typically we would like to use uh, model weights so that we can um, give models that are more likely higher weight than those that are less likely. The third uh, category of uncertainty is uncertainty about the future. Basically, this is uh, process variation, like variation in, in recruitment. Um, in our particular analysis, we haven't implemented that yet, so we, we're not providing advice on uh, biomass reference points in the future under different um, uh, management strategies, um, but that's not something that's that difficult to implement if you want to. Okay, so the rest of the presentation is basically going to follow the five main steps in doing the uh, risk analysis. Um, first of all, we're, we're establishing a hierarchy of uh, hypotheses and uh, models. Um, then we will uh, discuss a, a weighting system to weight these models and hypotheses, then how to calculate the probability distributions for the quantities of interest for a particular model, and then how to combine those uh, across uh, multiple models. And finally, how to present the results uh, in a form of uh, risk analysis. Okay, so the hierarchical structure um, we've used for hypotheses and models is based on uh, several different levels. And uh, on the first level, uh, we're looking at overarching hypotheses, uh, things like the number of uh, stocks that you're modeling. And these um, uh, hypotheses sort of represent uh, lots of different dis uh, disparate um, types of hypotheses. And so it might have different types of models, different types of data. So it's really hard to use model fit to weight these. 
So these overarching hypotheses are only uh, weighted based on expert opinion. And because of this uh, structure, then um, the, they provide sort of like a conditional probability approach so that anything under them is conditional on the probabilities of those overarching hypotheses. At level two is where all the main hypotheses uh, are represented. And we have um, different sub-levels in these. And so each sub-level is representing an issue with the stock assessment. Um, and often we, we do these in combination. So you can see here that for each hypothesis at level uh, 2A, um, the hypotheses at level 2B are repeated. And then on the third level, um, we have sub-hypotheses. And the reason we put this level in here is to deal with some specific problems such as um, looking at uh, parameter values that uh, we don't want the data to uh, inform or perhaps to make uh, reduce the number of um, model runs that we do or for other uh, efficiency um, reasons. And then we, once you have all these models um, defined, then we combine them all uh, using the model weights to come up with some overall um, probability distribution of the quantity of interest. Um, that particular uh, framework uh, may not work uh, perfectly in all situations, and so it may need some kind of adjustment. And so here, um, uh, let me, I get my, so we've added two hypotheses here, one in yellow and one in purple. And so the one in yellow, um, you can see here, it's um, relevant for hypothesis uh, 2A uh, number two, but it's not relevant for uh, hypothesis 2A number one. So you can see 2A number one here and 2A number two. So it's only relevant for this hypothesis here in uh, level 2A. Whereas in the one in purple, uh, that hypothesis actually addresses both issues, both issue A and issue B. Uh, so therefore it can be used uh, as a single model uh, to deal with both of those issues. Okay, the next two slides are just there to put this in words, so I won't go through that. Okay, so the next component of the um, risk analysis is defining the weighting system to weight these alternative uh, models. Um, and this is broken down into four uh, steps. The first is to establish uh, the weight categories that are used uh, to um, score the weights. And then the weight metrics, which are actually the specific uh, metrics where we're doing the scoring. And then we have to assign the weights and uh, rescale them so that they can be used in a probabilistic uh, framework for the model uh, probabilities. And then the final part is a little different, and that's just trying to um, reduce the number of hypotheses to make the analysis uh, more practical. So um, the weight categories we used uh, um, are used because all of the um, metrics are subjective. And so we use these general weight categories, and then we assign a value to uh, each of those uh, categories. So you can see here, as you go up in the uh, weight category, we've just doubled the value that we're assigning to that model. Um, other approaches could be used, but uh, this is what we um, did for our tuner assessments. Okay, the next component is the weight metric. So this is basically how we're going to determine the reliability of models and, and how we score them. The first metric is based on uh, expert opinion, and it's assigned a priori without consideration of the model fit to the data. And so this is basically just the expert's opinion based on their previous um, work on this assessment or on assessments of similar species, you know, general population dynamics theory, knowledge about biology and ecology and things like that. The next uh, metric is based on the convergence criteria of the estimation algorithm that's being used. And in our approach, we basically just gave uh, a, 
a weight of one to those models that had a positive definite Hessian and a weight of zero to those that didn't. Uh, obviously, you want to make sure that you've investigated, uh, invested a lot of time in uh, getting the convergence to work before applying this. Um, the next uh, weighting metric is based on the fit of the model to the data, and this can be a little complicated, so I'm going to talk about that in the following slide. Then we have a weighting metric for the plausibility of the parameters um, estimated by the model for those parameters representing the hypotheses. Um, and part of the reason for doing this is often if you add an extra parameter, that parameter can be estimated to adjust for some other model misspecification. And so if it goes to a unrealistic value, then you don't want to use that model. Um, so the next one is uh, related to that, and that's the plausibility of results. Uh, this one's a little more complicated because you're interested in the results, so you don't want to be filtering out models that have uh, certain results because that will determine the final results you use. However, you also don't want to have models that have um, unrealistic estimation of, of different quantities. One example of that would be uh, the, the size of the population, the biomass levels. Although that's a little hard to uh, determine whether it's realistic or not. So a related quantity would be fishing mortality, which is related through the catch to the biomass. It might be easier to determine if that's plausible or not based on the, the exploitation history of that particular uh, fishery or population. The final, final weighting metric is the uh, based on uh, several different diagnostics, and this is measuring the reliability of the model. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in detail next. So as far as the uh, metric based on weighting, um, as I mentioned earlier, the models are very complicated, lots of parameters. We don't know how to weight the data properly. So standard rules based on AIC are probably not applicable. So we just simply gave a high weight for the model that has the best AIC and a low weight for the model that has the worst AIC and a linear relationship for models in between. Um, applying this approach based on AIC make, needs um, to have the same data for each model and the same data weighting. Um, so there may need to be some uh, modifications. So for example, what we did was for models with data specific to a parameter, for example, if we added age at length data in when we were estimating growth, then we would just calculate the AIC without that data. Um, in other cases where the data was different, we will just um, evaluate the uh, metric for fit in groups based on uh, having the same type of data. There may also be some issues if you're changing the amount of process variability that's being estimated as well. But we uh, didn't do that in our application. So as far as diagnostics go, um, the first uh, measure of uh, diagnostics was based on age structure production model, the uh, R0 likelihood component profile and a catch curve uh, diagnostic. Um, and these are grouped together because they all provide information about what um, different types of data are telling us about absolute biomass. And I'm going to explain how we do that in a little bit uh, in the next slide. Uh, we also have uh, um, one based on retrospective analysis and then um, three based on residuals for the three main components of uh, data in, the, in typical models and uh, one of those being the recruitment previous. So um, for weighting based on the R0 profile and age structure production model, we use this uh, flow chart here. And so first of all, we use the R0 profile to determine whether or not composition data are driving the estimates. And if they are, then we look to see whether the in information from the index is consistent with the composition. If it's not, then we give it a low weight because that model is being driven by the composition data. However, if the in index and the composition data are consistent or the composition data are not driving uh, the estimates of absolute abundance, 
then we use the age structure production model. And because um, the tuners are short-lived and uh, with high, highly variable recruitment, uh, we therefore use the age structure production model where the recruitment deeds are estimated. And so in that analysis, if the confidence intervals are large, there's not really much information telling us how consistent these mo this model is, so we give that a medium weight. However, if the confidence intervals are small, then we compare the uh, age structured production model with the integrated model. And uh, if those results are not the same, then we um, assume that the composition data is driving the assessment and we give it a low weight. If they're consistent, then we give it a high weight. So that's how we use those diagnostics to develop the, the weight for that particular metric. Um, we also added additional um, metric um, because one of the issues in the assessment was that the uh, model wasn't fitting the composition data very well, particularly for fisheries of asthmatotic selectivity at the large sizes. So we use what we call the empirical selectivity diagnostic. And basically we're comparing the empirical selectivity with those, the selectivity estimated in the stock assessment model. The empirical selectivity is, is simply the catch at length and numbers divided by the estimated abundance at length and numbers. And so this focuses more on large fish, uh, which tend to be more influential in uh, estimating absolute abundance. And so here I have a, a simple example of a logistic um, asymptotic selectivity in the model, which is the circles, and then the empirical selectivity in red. And as you can see here, it's not fit, it's not corresponding very well at large fish, suggesting that the selectivity might be dome-shaped. However, one alternative might be is something that is wrong with the growth. So here we're on the right-hand side, we're estimating growth. And as you can see here, when we do that, we get more of a asymptotic selectivity. It still isn't fitting uh, uh, corresponding uh, perfectly, but at least it's um, asymptotic, uh, suggesting that, that uh, estimating growth might be one way to uh, deal with this uh, issue. Okay, so the next part of the weighting system is how to assign and rescale the weights. Uh, so as far as rescaling it goes, uh, it really depends on the level of the hierarchy you're in. So at level one, the overarching hypotheses, um, we rescale across all of those overarching hypotheses. Um, and then the weights for those will be multiplied by the weights from the other levels. So it's a, a conditional probability type of framework. At level two, um, we rescale within each sub-level, such as A and B, uh, within a branch of the hierarchy. So that's, in this case, within a particular overarching hypothesis. The exception to this is for model fit when there's different data. In that case, you uh, rescale within groups of models with the same data. And on the final level, level three, the uh, sub-hypotheses, we rescale to sum to one within a branch of the hierarchy, for example, for a given level two hypothesis. Um, so we also have to assign these weights, um, and we do this again um, by level. And so, in level one, um, it's relative to, we only use expert opinion and it's rescaled relative to all overarching hypotheses. On level two, it depends on the weighting metric. For convergence, plausible parameters, plausible results and diagnostics, um, we do the uh, assignment of weights relative to all models and all hypotheses. Uh, with fit, it's relative to models that use the same data uh, and that's independent of the branch of the hierarchy. However, for expert opinion, it's relative to models in the same branch of the hierarchy. For example, in, in, in level two here, we are assigning the expert opinion based on assuming that the overarching hypothesis that that is under is true. And finally, on the third level, it's relative to models in the same branch of the hierarchy as well. And so that's for any given level two hypothesis. Okay, so the final part of the weighting system is how to reduce the number of models. Um, again, I mentioned before that these models are highly computational, they have lots of parameters, lots of data, and so they might take a long time to run. 
And also some of the diagnostics like the age structure production um, diagnostic and the um, R0 profile retrospective analysis can all be computationally intensive. So we want to uh, minimize the number of hypotheses to make the assessment practical. Um, when a metric is assigned a, an assigned a zero, it uh, eliminates that model from the analysis. So it's a good idea to run um, the weighting metrics that are easy to calculate first so that you can eliminate um, those models so they don't need the other more computational uh, metrics calculated. Also, if a metric is more likely to eliminate models, it might be a good idea to run that one first too, um, so you can eliminate models before doing the other metrics. We can also try and eliminate models um, as groups. One way of doing that is you define a base model, and this tends to be the simpler model. Then um, if the base model is eliminated, then all other models derived from this model can also be eliminated. However, you have to be careful with this because um, these more complicated models may actually correct for the reason that the base model was eliminated. In our case, what we did was we had submodels for different values of steepness of the stock recruitment relationship. And so we ran all the diagnostics with steepness equals one. And if that model was eliminated, then we would actually eliminate all the other steepness values as well. Uh, we also did a simplification where some of the diagnostics were based just on the uh, steepness equals one um, model, and those metrics weights were also included for the other steepness values without recalculating them. So not uh, perfect, but a good way to uh, reduce the number of calculations that are needed. So the next component of the risk analysis is calculating the probability distributions for quantities of interest for a given model. Um, again, we always come back to the same thing, these models being highly computationally intensive and difficult to run. So um, it's often difficult to run full Bayesian MCMC on a lot of models. Um, so what we did was we used a normal approximation based on the estimates and the standard errors. We were using stock synthesis, so standard areas were not available for all the quantities we wanted. Uh, so we had to approximate those based on quantities that were uh, output from stock synthesis with uh, standard areas. Then this uh, resulting normal distribution is rescaled to uh, turn it into a, a probability distribution. So it integrates to one or sums to one. Um, so the normal distribution approach works well when the data is very informative. However, um, the, pro the real probability distribution may be asymmetrical. Um, so we did in a, a very limited cases, looked at posteriors derived from MCMC and compared those to see if the normal approximation was uh, reliable. And this is one example of that, where the spawning, current spawning biomass as a ratio of the version spawning biomass is, is plotted here. Uh, the red line is the limit reference point. The blue line is the normal approximation and the, the black bars is the uh, Bayesian posterior distribution. And so the distributions actually look quite close, but you can note that the Bayesian distribution has um, thicker tails. And, um, and that can be a problem when you're looking at uh, limit reference points because generally it's the tails where the action is occurring. And so if you look over here to see the probabilities, the normal approximation only has a 6% probability of exceeding the limit reference point, where the uh, Bayesian uh, posterior has a 15%. So that's quite a big difference. And in our case, there's a, the criteria is a 10% probability of exceeding the limit reference point. So you can see one of them is under that, one of them is over that. So we get different management results based on whether we use the Bayesian or the normal approximation. The next thing we have to do is combine the probability distributions across uh, all the different models. Um, and essentially all we're doing here is summing up the uh, probability of the quantity of interest given the model times the probability of the model. And to do this, we basically determine the weight of each model uh, and then we rescale that um, so it forms a probability by making it sum or integrate to one. 
Uh, then we calculate the probability of the quantity of interest for each model, again, rescaling that to some integrate to one. And then we multiply those together um, and we evaluate that for all the different management quantities we're interested in. So the final component is presenting the results in the form of risk analysis. Uh, so the, the easiest thing to do is just plot the distribution um, that you've calculated, which is combined across all models. Um, however, sometimes it's useful to plot those distributions by components. Uh, for example, like the hypotheses at level 2a and 2b, just to see what the differences are between those. Um, if we want to evaluate reference points, uh, we can use uh, cumulative probability density functions. Um, then we're getting more complicated. We might want to look at decision tables to look at different management options. And I'll describe that in detail in the following slides. Or we could use risk curves where we're just plotting the, the outcome versus uh, different management actions. So this is a, a basically a simple decision table. And you can see at the top, we have the states of nature and their associated probabilities. On the left-hand column, we have the different management actions. In the body of the table, we have the outcome of those management actions. And then on the right-hand uh, column, we have the, um, the outcome integrated over each of the states of nature weighted by the probabilities. And so here's some uh, examples of those. So for example, the management action could be catch or effort or closure days as in what we use in the tunas in the Eastern Pacific. As far as the states of nature, they could be each individual model or it could be a group of models to reduce the complexity of the table or it could even be a derived quantity such as the uh, absolute biomass level. And as far as the outcomes, there could be things like catch, variability in catch, biomass, or even probability statements like we uh, have for our harvest control rule. So I'm just gonna briefly go over something from um, our application to Big Eye Tuna. And so Big Eye Tuna was conducted uh, in stock synthesis. It has uh, many fisheries. The main data is CPUE and length composition. Um, the overarching hypothesis is whether or not a regime shift in recruitment, which occurs or is estimated when the fishery on juveniles expanded, whether or not that is real. Um, or is it just an artifact of some kind of model misspecification? The issues we have um, are a regime shift in recruitment, particularly if it's under the overarching hypothesis that's not real and then uh, misfit to large fish in composition data from, asymptotic, from the asymptotic fishery. And the way we scored this is we basically, because it's all subjective at this stage, we just had a panel of experts that subjectively assigned those weights based on the metrics. So this is the uh, flow chart for the hypotheses for big eye tuna. And so you can see here the at the overarching level is, is the regime shift real or not? If it is real, then we have one hypothesis that is it's caused by uh, the environment. And so we estimate a uh, change in recruitment uh, when the regime shift occurred as a parameter in the model. Um, if it's not real, it's an artifact of the model. Um, it's either due to uh, something that we don't know about, so we start the model after the regime shift occurred and hope that it avoids any uh, model misspecification, or we model that period and then we try, try to use other factors to get rid of the uh, regime shift, such as natural mortality or movement, uh, estimating growth, estimating dome shape selectivity, or estimating adult natural mortality. Um, at uh, level two, we have the issue of the misfit to the composition data. And there we have uh, uh, estimating growth, dome shape selectivity, or natural mortality that might solve that issue. On the third level, we have sub hypotheses that represent different values of the steepness of the stock recruitment relationship. And those are repeated for each of the uh, hypotheses in level two. So uh, 
Here we have the uh, target reference points on the left and the limit reference points on the right. At the top is the probability density uh, distribution and on the bottom is the cumulative probability uh, distribution. And so um, one thing to note from here is you can see that there's, there's two modes in the probability distribution, both for the target and the limit. Um, but if we take this as a whole, if you look at the cumulative probability distributions, we have about a 50% chance of the fishing mortality being above the target fishing mortality, which is what you would like. So it's a pretty good result. And then on the limit reference point, we only have a 5% probability of the fishing mortality being above the limit, which is less than the 10% in the harvest control rule. So that was not, um, that particular reference point was not triggered. Um, so it's a good idea, like I mentioned, to look at the components of uh, that distribution. And so the, the combined distribution is black. And then we've got three components here. The uh, orange, which is more pessimistic, is uh, representing the short-term models. The uh, gray is the medium-term models and the blue is the uh, models that assume that the regime shift in recruitment is uh, real. And so you can see here, those sets of models give uh, quite different results, some being more optimistic and the others being more pessimistic. Uh, so something worth considering when giving management advice, not just presenting the, the overall result, but uh, presenting some of the components. So that might be taken into consideration. And so uh, looking at that in terms of a COBE plot, so we have, if you're not familiar with those, we have the spawning biomass divided by the spawning biomass, biomass at MSY on the x-axis and the fishing mortality divided by the fishing mortality at MSY on the y-axis and I've got every single model plotted here and the black line is basically the combined of all models with their 95% uh, confidence intervals um, and that's using model weighting um, but I also have two different other sets of models here where you have the uh, pessimistic models which mostly are the short-term models and the optimistic models and so you can see depending on how you interpret these results you might have a, a reasonable result, or you might have a, a result that's a little more um, pessimistic or optimistic. So as far as uh, looking at the uh, decision table and the risk curves, what we do in the IATTC for management is we have a seasonal closure. And so what we're gonna do is look at those fishing mortality level probabilities under uh, different fishery closures. Um, again, we didn't do spawning biomass because we did not do projection. So first of all, look look at the left-hand figure here. So we saw this before. So this is for the uh, the limit reference point, and you can see the two modes. And when we look into detail in these two modes, the optimistic mode is coming from models that estimate a high biomass. And when you have a high biomass, when the fishery on juveniles expanded, it didn't really have much of an impact on the uh, index of abundance in the biomass. And so therefore you don't need a regime shift in recruitment to explain the increase in catch, or an increased recruitment to explain the increase in catch. However, um, with the, uh, the short term models where the uh, regime shift is explained, um, is, is actually kind of ignored because we're not using it, um, then you end up getting uh, lower biomass estimates. And so really the difference between these is the absolute biomass uh, estimated by those models. And if we look at a uh, risk analysis, uh, using a risk curve, we have closure days on the x-axis and we have the risk or the probability of exceeding the, the limit reference point. You can see here with the, the black line, you can see that under current management, which is the, the vertical uh, dotted line, you can see that we're below the 10% level, so we're okay. However, 
if we just chose the pessimistic models, which is the short-term models, we would say we were just at the cutoff criteria, so action may have to be taken. Um, the same type of information can be shown in a decision table. Um, so you can see here, we have uh, basically um, the days of closure on the left-hand column. We have uh, the different models across the top here, and then the probability of those models. Note that some models are, are quite probable, so we have 22% probability given to this short-term model where growth is estimated. We're only a 1% probability of the model which assumes that the regime shift is real and there's no other modifications to the model. Um, so in the body of the table, you can see the probability of um, exceeding the MSY level or the limit reference point, and we've color coded those by 50% in the MSY one and 10% in the limit reference point. And then on the far right hand column is the, uh, the final value that you would get if you combined all those models together using their uh, model weights. And so you can see there's quite a variety of results depending on what model you would uh, choose and how you would weight this, um, you would get different results. So in summary, um, the IATDC assessments, just like any assessment, are uncertain. Um, the, uh, so uncertainty, uh, both model and um, parameter uncertainty should be taken into consideration. We have a harvest control rule that specifically includes probability statements to deal with uncertainty. Um, so that requires us to do some kind of risk analysis type approach. Um, by taking the model uncertainty into consideration, we've moved from a base case assessment type framework to a set of reference models. Um, we use this hierarchy of hypotheses to, to develop the models and um, facilitate the weighting of those models. The rigorous statistical framework is not applicable because the models are so complex and we can't weight data properly. So therefore we used a, uh, a range of uh, metrics to determine the reliability of models and use that to assign the model probabilities. And we presented the results in a decision table um, to look at alternative uh, management actions. Um, just to highlight some of the main concepts, um, the um, alternative hypotheses we use to address specific issues in the stock assessment. We use the hierarchical structure to resent, represent those hypotheses and facilitate their development and data weighting. And model weighting was based more on diagnostics um, and not just on the fit to the data. Um, some interesting points that might be worth discussing. Um, in this approach, are we really doing assemble modeling and risk analysis, or is it really just um, model development and model selection? Because we're, we're basing everything on diagnostics uh, and not on model fit. Um, all the metrics were um, subjective, so we really need to have a more objective and transparent way of scoring. Uh, there's other diagnostics that could be used. Um, Henning and Craig and I are working on posterior predictive checks uh, and using frequentist equivalents or approximations. Uh, they tend to be uh, trendy at the moment, so that might be a useful way to do it. Uh, Laurie and Cal and his group are doing one step ahead predictions and they're sort of relying heavily on that. Um, Another thing that's kind of a little confusing is that for the parameter uncertainty, we're actually using the data to represent that. But however, for the model uncertainty, we're not using the data, we're using more of the diagnostics, which seems to be a little bit contradictory. And finally, um, on the IATTC websites, which are there at the bottom, um, you can find presentations and, and, uh, and documents describing this method in more detail, particularly its application to um, Yellowfin and Big Eye Tuna. So you'll see that there'll be uh, documents that describe the alternative hypotheses, uh, how we weighted the different hypotheses, 
and um, the stock assessments that were developed to, to represent those hypotheses, as well as a document and presentation on how those were used in uh, providing management advice. Um, so thanks everybody for being patient and listening to that, and I'm um, looking forward to getting some feedback and answering your questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I wonder if you would be interested in leaving that discussion slide up so folks can think about some of those forward thinking points you have next on your to-do list for this project. And while they're thinking about that, I have some technical questions that came up from our own Andre Punt during your talk. Um, the first one is how different is this approach from the approach used by Dale K and company, for example, for SBT, which I think you mean Southern Bluefin Tuna. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not that familiar with what they did in terms of how they weighted their models. Um, so maybe if Andre has some information on that, maybe you could explain and then we could discuss it. I can unmute Andre. Uh, so Andre, how this works is I'm going to click on the unmute button for you that then gives you permission to unmute. So don't click anything right now. Um, now you can click something. Hopefully I picked the right Andre. There are yeah, two I think of you. you're, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, you might want to think about this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it what they do is, and I, I as you went through, there was, there are some quite big differences, but uh, what they essentially do was a lot, they do a lot more models, I think, than you do. Um, you know, I think with SBT, they did something like 300 models. Um, and then for some of the other, you, 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 you know, they, I think they're all essays, so you can do them pretty quickly. But, um, and then they sort of had binary, um, uh, binary checks based on, and I don't think you had much in the way of like residual patterns and stuff like that. You, you, you had far more options than I think they did. So I think I got the answer afterwards. Um, the other thing, I, I, I might have missed it, but they I don't think they use the distributions of outcomes conditional on a model, whereas you have. Is that correct? Uh, we, we did. Uh, I'm not sure what they did. But they, they did because yeah. essentially, the point they made was that the uh, the variance within a model is is pretty poor anyway because it depends on data weighting and all that kind of stuff. So there, there is far more to gain from between model variance. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, between model variance rather than the within model stuff. Yeah, but presumably they would have run a lot of models with different parameter values. So for example, we ran a model estimating natural mortality where they probably ran a model with 10 different values of natural mortality. Correct, correct. And then, and then provided a prior on that natural mortality for weighting those models rather than using the data to weight them. Yep, 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 that's that's exactly what they did. So it's philosophically different, but I mean, I, I, I guess what I would have written if I got to the end of the talk was, yeah, I love the way you sort of pulled out the, dis the chop up of the distribution into different components. And I guess I'd like to have seen that a little bit more. So if you just base the distribution on the, the best estimates of the parameters, what would the distribution look like? How does it affect the tail probabilities and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this discussion we're having right now is related to that last question. So in our analysis, we're using um, the data for the parameter uncertainty. Whereas in the bluefin tuna, they actually didn't use the data for the parameter uncertainty. They just used uh, probably expert judgment and maybe some of the diagnostics weighting as well. Yep. Awesome. Okay. The question Thank is, you. do you believe your parameter uncertainty? Well, yeah, so we're a bit contradictory because we don't believe our model uncertainty based on the data, but we believe our parameter uncertainty based on the data. So um, the problem is how much prior, how much do you rely on the prior information and the diagnostics for those parameter values? So, yeah. I, I would turn it around and say, 
if you just took the point estimates, how I mean, I, I think that break, breaking things down by removing dimensions is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Andre, don't go away just yet. Um, you also asked a question about are are some aren't some of the weights not independent? Did did that get further clarified, or are you still thinking about that? I'm still thinking about that. So some of the like the weightings based. I mean, you went really fast, and I'm presuming when you talk to the SSC, you're going to give us an actual document. Um, but things, some of those diagnostics seem uh, they're, they're they're not independent. So if you fail the R zero diagnostic are you likely to fail some of the other ones as well and how does that all interact yeah so let me just quickly go up to the slide of the weights uh, where are way up here somewhere. yep that's it well, so how many of these you know for example yeah. if you've got okay um, Yeah, like yeah. the so, so for the these, and the okay. index residuals are almost certainly going to be correlated. Yeah. Okay. So these these ones here, these these uh, weighting factors were all multiplied together. Yep. So they they each have the same type of weight, and if they equal zero, then they eliminate the model. The diagnostics is actually made up of all of these weights. And we add those together rather than uh, multiplying them. So that so each of these diagnostics actually has a limited, a more limited impact on the overall weighting. And the one at the top, of course, is combining three things. And so those three um, components have um, less weight than the others as well. And you're right, there are some. Um, dependence between these. Um, in our analysis, we actually found that we didn't really do much weighting based on residuals. So we actually, we didn't, in the end, we didn't use the recruitment residuals. Um, and that's because you expect to have residuals in recruitment. And so it's a little bit difficult to understand how to apply that. And the, there was no real uh, index residual patterns or anything either. So that had no impact. And the composition residuals, had uh, only a small amount of impact as well. So in the end, um, even though those ones are correlated with the other ones, they didn't have much impact. But you're right. I mean, some groups like the the group I'm working with in Europe are only using a couple of weighting factors. They use the, I think the residuals, they use retrospective analysis, and they use um, the one step ahead uh, projections. And so they only use those three. Yeah, I mean, I guess my the way to answer my question is is to, I mean, the nice thing at the end of this is you presume you've got a spreadsheet of lots and lots of models with lots and lots of types of weight. So you can essentially do a, a sensitivity test to saying, if I removed one of these diagnostics, what, are, what would change? Yeah. Which I'm sure yeah. you've done. No, we haven't done. The only one we did is with weighting and without weighting. And it oh, okay. I mean, that should be pretty easy to do because then you can alleviate the concern that it's all being driven by one criteria somewhere along the line. Yeah, that could be done. We can also do it by uh, each expert by expert to see how much variability among experts there are and things like that. I'm not sure there are experts, to be honest, but I'll leave you that. Well, that that's a different discussion. So the next Andre question is, does this mean that the uninformative comp data, compositional data, would yield a higher weight in this system? Oh, that's the flow chart um, where you're, you're doing the, uh, it's to do with the ASPM diagnostic. This one? Yeah, yeah. so if, you're, if you got crappy composition data, wouldn't you more or less end up in medium weight? Um, maybe, but that's okay because the composition data are not driving the assessment. So part of these hmm. uh, diagnostics are to make sure that, well, basically it's to make sure that the index and the composition data are consistent. And if they're not consistent, we generally feel that the composition data are the ones that are causing the problem because misspecified growth, natural mortality or selectivity. 
Mm -hmm. um, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, obviously, if, if that uh, assumption is wrong, then of course the, the weighting is wrong. But in general, I prefer to get rid of composition data information by estimating additional parameters than I do about throwing out an index, particularly if it's a um, re uh, representative index. But doesn't that mean if you downweight your comp data, you increase the weight on the model? Um, yes, you probably would. Okay. Which I know, these, I know I understand. Good, a good thing. You don't like comp data, do you? No. The final recorded Andre question is, uh, is there sensitivity to leaving out the type 3B level? I can't even remember what that is anymore. That's the uh, sub hypothesis. In our case, it was uh, steepness of the stock recruitment relationship. Yeah, I, it might, it was more, my question is more general, which is, you know, essentially not quite bootstrapping, but, you know, looking at, you know, basically what would happen if you left because there's a whole bunch of factors and it's hard to know which ones really matter. So if you essentially replace level one by an equal probability, how would that change the the final answer, which is the probability of, of F being greater than F limb, basically? So in our Big Eye Turner example, what we did was our expert opinion, which included only stock assessment scientists and no one that knew, knew something about this, um, was, 20% that the hypothesis was true and 80% that it was an artifact of model misspecification. And the um, environmental hypotheses were optimistic. And so if you put more weight on the regime shift being true, then you would probably get more optimistic results and it would probably be quite sensitive to that. Well, I think it's given where you've got arbitrary, sorry, expert arbitrary, same thing, but uh, where you're relying on, you know, because basically all of these criteria are a little bit arbitrary. I think you you're, you you acknowledge that, but yeah. just basically seeing, you know, it's not it's it's sort of sensitivity to weighting. Yeah, no, I think that's important. Um, the next thing that we're we're trying to do is is trying to make these more objective, which might be difficult, but at least more transparent. Um, you know, at the moment we just had the experts provide their um, scoring after some discussions about it. Um, and interestingly enough, the two people on the panel that had the most experience doing a SOC assessment were the most different. Um, but we want to try and rather than do that, we want to have sort of rules. The rules might be still subjective, but at least they'd be agreed upon and it would be more transparent. So if you got a weight of medium, you know why you got a weight of medium. It wasn't just because Mike Maunder thought about that on that particular day. I mean, the other thing which I didn't write down is, is the choice of the model structure. You didn't really get into that. So, you know, why isn't there um, if I, I, I think I'm, I think I've reviewed this assessment. Um, you know, why isn't there a spatial model in there? You know, so basically, it's uh, with with model uncertainty, it's the models in and then the models that you've ignored. Yeah. So that's what you're talking about here is the Big Eye Turner example. Um, we actually had a more complicated uh, flow chart that had spatial models and a few other models in here, um, but those got eliminated. Some of them got eliminated because when we ran models, the diagnostics didn't look good, and so they got eliminated pretty quickly. A couple got eliminated because of expert opinion. We didn't think that they were appropriate models. The spatial models, they got eliminated because we'd done previous analyses and they didn't get rid of the regime shift in recruitment um, to a large degree, and so we, we left those out as well. Um, Part of it is also due to how many models you can run for a particular analysis. Um, and so for yellowfin tuna, we had two other spatial structure type hypotheses, but we basically didn't follow up on those, partly because of time constraints and partly because the models we were running 
we thought were better and, and, and actually uh, encompass some of the other assumptions to some degree. So there are a lot of trade-offs here um, in, in terms of what you can do within the given time. I'll Thank you for answering those. Andre, you get a five minute uh, cool down because Jimmy Anelli has a question. Um, oh, I'll give... the question is, I'm going to submit your comments on page proofs, right? Mm, stop asking people for their manuscript. Go away. I'll mute you. Okay, so Jim's question, and I'll give them the ability to um, unmute in a second. Where do robust likelihood considerations come in <laughs> uh, where most fisheries data may have significant outliers, which some likelihoods might be very sensitive to, like a multinomial distribution? Um, and I will go and unmute the, or give you the ability to unmute if you want to talk, Jim. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question, Jim. Yeah, so currently in our structure, we don't have anything related to that. Um, obviously, if the stock assessment model had a robust likelihood, it would be automatically included in the analysis. Um, the some of the diagnostics would deal with outliers. Obviously, if you you've, if you had an outlier, you might see a residual pattern or something in, in one of those diagnostics. Um, but the one thing that might be worth thinking about is whether or not you left out those data points or, and that consisted of a alternative hypothesis. So that particular data point was basically a fabrication or, or misrecording or something like that, but it was highly influential. Um, I guess you could have two different models, one with a uh, standard likelihood function, another one with a robust likelihood function, and that'd be two different hypotheses. Um, however, there you would have a problem using the um, fit to the data as the weighting criteria. And so I guess it would fit better in this framework where we're focusing more on diagnostics anyway. So I think it would fit fairly well into this framework. Okay. That is all I currently have from the written questions from the audience. I don't know if Mark, if you want to uh, navigate back to that discussion page, but if folks have any other questions, if you could use the raise hand feature and we could work on um, unmuting you to ask the question if you can't find the type. Otherwise, I'll give about 45 seconds for you to type something else or at least type a, hey, wait for me to type a longer question. All right. Thanks for your patience. This platform does require a bit of awkward silence as folks type things. Okay, Andre wants, Andre, you are now allowed to unmute again. Yeah, I'm still, still on about the sort of it's not number two about objective and transparent scoring. I think it's more as much about of defining the process that led to the models a little clearer. You, 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 you know, there's certainly objective and transparent scoring, but it's sort of conditional on the model itself. And I, I think that, you know, if you stand up in front of a group that doesn't like your answer, the question is, did you choose, how did you choose the, the set of models basically? because there's an infinite number of models you didn't look at. Um, not to say that I don't like what you've done, because I think this is definitely a, a, an improvement. Also, yes. I'm not sure about posterior predict, frequent just equivalent to posterior predictions or residual analysis, I think. Yeah, that's slight, slightly different, but anyway, um, still working on that one. It's complicated. Um, so regard to your first um, point, that 
the way we really did it was we had an assessment, it had some issues, and therefore we tried to address each of those issues by applying some alternative models. And so the, the better that they addressed the issues, the more weight they ended up getting in the assessment. So that was kind of our approach, was basically um, working from that. So we didn't, we didn't just sit down and think, what are all the possible models that we could be using? We said, we have a problem with our assessment, how do we fix it? And what are the different approaches to fixing it? And then we applied those, and then we just include included the models that kind of made sense and, and were practical for us to implement. So I think our approach was somewhat reasonable, um, but maybe it didn't include the full suite of models that might have been uh, important to include. Can I throw out a controversial one? Sure. Shouldn't you be telling IATTC not to use very low probability events in their decision making? I mean, at the end of the day, you're being asked to do something that's really, really, really hard. Um, I mean, Doug, Doug Butterworth and I have spent 20 years talking about this. Um, and essentially, our conclusion is trying to estimate tail probabilities in uh, poorly specified, misspecified models where the data don't follow any distribution. You're never going to get good estimates of tail probabilities. Um, I think he goes further than I do and says it's probably a waste of time pretending that we can estimate tail probabilities. Okay, so I, I agree with you there. Um, the problem is that international fisheries law suggests that limit reference points should be things that are unlikely to occur. So it automatically determines that you should be looking at, at uh, tails of the distribution. Um, so perhaps we should be reevaluating what our objectives are, I guess, and what the international law is to. Yeah, I mean, to give you an example, you as what you know well as I do, but um, the control rules for the North Pacific, for example, uh, where the F target, the OFL target is F whatever thirty five, but the sorry, the yeah the A, the OFL is F thirty five, the ABC is F40. So there's no, there's, you know, they're putting in a buffer there, but they're not quantifying it in a probabilistic way. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's philosophical. It's, but it, it's a, it's a, you know, it, you, what you, you, I mean, I remember one of the Pacific Council discussions, some, I think it was an NGO, wanted what strategy will have a 99% chance of success? And I, all I did was I worked out how many simulations you would have to run even to know even estimate the probability at that level. So you, you, you know, just getting the distribution right, even if you knew the model was almost impossible. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's something we probably should take into consideration is, is redefining those probabilities. I mean, it's not your fault. It's that's a management thing, but it, it makes yeah. the analysis much more difficult. Yes, true. Yeah. Particularly since the, uh, exceeding limit reference points generally have a huge impact on management. Mark, I wonder, do you have any questions for people that are here? It's kind of like an untraditional question. Um, probably, but let me think about that. Um, I mean, Perhaps I, I you guess ask the question if you're at the SSC in November, what questions would we ask you? <laughs> yeah, but we don't know the answer. Yeah, um, I guess I guess one thing is whether it is appropriate to use diagnostics to provide probability statements about models rather than using the data because that's essentially what we're doing. That's what a lot of other people are starting to do now too, is basically it's, it's more about whether the model is somewhat reasonable rather than the probability of the model. I mean, normally we would apply a diagnostics and if it failed, we'll throw the model out. But here we're saying we run a diagnostics, it fails, so we downweight it.
I see that Leachy and Jimmy and Ellie, because they're at the same stock assessment review meeting, has their hand up. Did you, I've unmuted or allowed you to unmute. Are you wanting to answer Mark's question? No, sorry, that, that, was, that was a mistake. No worries. Uh, so yes, thank you, Mark, for providing that. Does anyone want to use the raise hand feature or question to let me know if you want to answer Mark's query? Well, it's clearly wrong, but it's less wrong than I think anything else I've seen. How's that, Mark? Yeah, that's basically my opinion as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, if we, you know, I don't believe any of those likelihoods. So I, I have even, I mean, I'm even nervous about your AIC score. Yeah. But I, I'll go back to my original point, which is looking at the sensitivity if you've got all the results of these these models changing the weighting, you can actually look at you know how sensitive it is to some of the the arbitrary decisions you're making. By what happens if you just leave out the R zero profile? Does it change anything appreciably? If it does, then I think that's a piece of information you want to convey. But I, I think you're you're using a machine gun method to sort of decide if I if I use everything I can think of, hopefully I'll end up in the right place. So I, I guess another question would be, you know, some people use surplus production models plus, you know, stock synthesis models in the same ensemble. So how would you judge them when some of the diagnostics or the weighting metrics don't apply to all the models? They only apply to some of the models. Well, you can compare them when you can compare them, but I mean that's one of the challenges in ensemble modeling, right? You're, you're, I mean, even in your modeling, you're comparing models that have different data sets. So that's just a special case of production model versus synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're doing that with the short and long-term models because the long-term models have a lot more data. So in some sense, have a lot more opportunity for. Well, I guess you're waiting within the long-term models. You're evaluating the long-term models on the, the expert judgment, right? Well, the, the also the things like the diagnostics for residuals and things. So long-term models might be more likely to fail those because there's more years of residuals that could have. Happened. Exactly. I have discovered how to allow folks to unmute themselves. I will do this shortly if you all verbally pinky promise me that you won't abuse the power, otherwise everyone loses the privilege. And now- Yes, I will... mother. <laughs> Sorry, I've just been working around some of you folks for a while these days. Um, let's see, if I, oh yes. Full audio, yes, okay. Now, you should be able to do the traditional unmute to respond to Mark. <laughs> I'm also okay with letting Mark off the hook for the day. Brilliant. <laughs> All right, well, Mark, thank you so much for starting us off and sort of being a guinea pig for this platform and being so graceful and patient about it. Um, virtual round of applause for Mark and sharing his, his awesome work with us. Awesome. Um, see you guys in two weeks. We'll have Maya Sosa Kapoor presenting some of her work on transboundary sablefish stuff. It'll be workshopping, getting ready for, I believe, a council meeting later this quarter. Yeah, uh, they'll, be, they'll be on the same docket when we um, when they come up to the council. I think they're both on the November council meeting. I, I did have a question, which is, I don't know how many faculty are on this call. Um, obviously uh, one. I want to say zero. 
I, I believe I'm still employed. Um, mm. Yeah, but I, the reason I ask is obviously I just finished the faculty meeting literally 30 seconds before you start. So I was wondering if you can give people, a, a, you know, if, if there are other faculty, including me, to have a, a bit of a break between the faculty meeting and the start of this. Yeah, I'll take that on board and report back. Thank you. Wait, mm -hmm. on, don't I work for you? Don't you work for me? And did I say you work for me? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably learned that from you. Um, but in general, uh, one more announcement I just realized. We actually moved Andre off of the fall quarter lineup so we could incorporate Chris Legault to come in and talk about some work he's doing over on the East Coast. But don't worry, I rescheduled Andre for January. So if you're feeling sad about not hearing him talk this quarter, I got you. Um, other than that, please let me know if you have any other feedback via email like Andre has just provided is a great example. And other than that, please have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark.